So uh, the topic today is Catholic funerals. And um, I've got the two documents here. One is a uh, letter to parishioners, and the other is um, actually a worksheet that you could use to uh, indicate your preferences. I think what I want to begin with is to say that in the Catholic tradition, uh, funerals are very important. And the reason they are very important is because our, we are focused on Christ who came to conquer eternal death through the resurrection, his resurrection, but also sharing that victory with us. So our funerals are focused upon our sharing and our hope in our, that we have in sharing uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ to eternal life. So, um, obviously, um, if you don't want to live and you don't want to live forever, this is not the course for you. This is not the way. Uh, but um, for us, of course, it is the mystery of faith. The central part of our faith is that Christ has died and Christ has risen. And his death has conquered eternal death. His resurrection has given us life. And we celebrate that in a funeral. In the fullness, the fullest um, experience of a Catholic funeral, there are three parts. Much like, and I thought this was fascinating to learn, not terribly long ago, and that is that the Holy uh, Tritium, the three days, of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and, and Easter, uh, those three days are one liturgy. Uh, they don't, it's not three liturgies in three days. It's one prayer of the church, which incorporates the, um, the Last Supper, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so, on Holy Thursday, we begin all of our prayers with the sign of the cross, but we don't do that again through the next two liturgies because they are continuations of that liturgy. And it is the same way with funerals. The vigil at the funeral home or wherever it might be, at church, wherever the there's a vigil, a visitation, and then we enter into the funeral liturgy, the mass. And then we have the interment in blessed ground, hopefully. So that's the three movements. And, that, and that's why <clears throat> actually uh, at the funeral mass, you don't begin with the sign of the cross. Occasionally I do that, but technically you shouldn't because you did that at the vigil. You started the prayer at the vigil. You started the liturgy then. And it continues on from the, the visitation, the vigil, through the funeral mass to the interment. When I'm at the interment, I don't begin in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We already did that at the vigil. You see what I'm saying? It's very fascinating to me. And I think that this tradition that has been passed on is a very uh, rich one that uh, invites us to uh, be not afraid of death or going into the ground. Eternal rest granted to them, O oh Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. They're not going into the darkness. They're entering the light, let perpetual light shine. So all of this liturgy is meant to help us to celebrate the life, to uh, have some comfort for our grief and the fears that come with, with, with death. You know, we, are, we have a natural fear of death because we are built to live. Even if we get injured terribly, our body will go into shock 
to protect itself that we can go into a coma and all the energy, the blood actually will be drawn away from the extremities so that you continue to live. Now it might hurt your kidneys, but the body wants to live. And so there is a mechanism for sustaining our life that is built into us. So the fear of death is natural to our, our system. We will panic if we cannot breathe. And that panic is a way of saying, you've got to do something to start breathing. You can't stop, keep, you can't let this go on. If you've got energy and movement, get, get a breath, keep your life going. So fear is, is a natural, and even panic is a natural, uh, a human physical reaction to the danger of impending death. Our faith is meant to help us to see a bigger picture and that, uh, that death is not the end of us. Uh, the, the ego consciousness thinks that if I die, I, I am no longer. I've died, I've, I'm gone. But that's not what our faith sees. Our faith sees beyond this mortal life here. And, and the funeral liturgies are meant to help the family and friends to celebrate the life, but also to have confidence and to renew our confidence in the resurrection of Jesus that he shares with us, right? The best way, and I, I, I say it kind of bluntly, there's no better way to get to heaven than through the funeral mass. Now, because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. That was in John's Gospel. The early Christian community recognizes that he is the way. So how are you going to get to heaven? You're going to go through, what? Albuquerque, and then <laughs> Pikes Peak. Uh, you're going to go uh, uh, with your, your own power. You're going to get there on your own power and goodness. That's your, that's your spiritual currency. You're going to pay the toll at the gates of, of heaven. Enter into the, through the with your currency, with your spiritual. So for us, we, we say united to Christ. That's how we want to, we're going to go. That's how we, that's the best way to go. We have confidence in that because God has provided us the way. And how do we offer our life? How do we offer ourselves to God through Jesus? The mass is the way that Christ established and where they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. The presence of the risen Christ uh, is recognized there. He is made present there. And so uh, that is why at the Mass we offer pray brothers and sisters that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God. Well, how, how in the world is our sacrifice, our life, our, what we're offering God acceptable? How is that possible? I mean, most time it's pretty pitiful. If I just make a commentary right there. A lot of what we offer God is, is I think, paltry and pitiful because we're not holy as God is holy. Now, it might be the best we're doing, but it's, it's a little paltry. And it isn't enough to impress God. Exactly. But you don't have to impress God. I mean, even Vincent, your little, picks a little dandelion, you just think it's the most delightful flower in the world. No, it's a weed. <laughs> but you see, it's his gift. 
So you receive it, right? So God receives the dandelions that we pick and offer to him and cherishes them as if they were a dozen roses or whatever your favorite flower might be, right? So our sacrifice is joined to the perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Now that'll get you in the kingdom of heaven. His sacrifice will get you there. That's why we're baptized into Christ Jesus, joined to him so that we share his victory. Not because we merited it, but because it is gifted to us and we trust and trust ourselves to it. That's why we try to follow him. So therefore, at a funeral mass, we're offering this life, this our loved one's life to God through Jesus. By the way, you may notice that at a funeral, I tend to, you can use incense a couple of times if you like. Incense is a way of symbolizing our prayers rising to God. We don't use it in our tradition a great deal. We used to use it more in adoration or the blessed exposition of the blessed sacrament of man. Uh, it, was, it was used in the Jewish tradition, a symbol of what was offering to God smoke, holy smoke, this, this arom aromatic uh, sap, really. And it creates smoke, it creates a smell. And, and they used to use it when there was a sacrifice of an animal. Because have you ever been around a slaughtered animal? <laughs> spilling of their blood. You know what it smells like? And don't puncture the gut with a knife or it will smell worse. Just telling you. So when the sacrifices were made on the altar, the lambs and the bulls and all of that, it didn't smell so great. So guess what they wanted to offer to God? Some perfume. And the incense created a perfume that at least masked some of the stench of the slaughter. All right, that's part of where it comes from, all right? But it also became symbolic of our, our the offering going in, where is God? Well, God's everywhere, right? But in the ancient days, the heavens, he was up. So where do you want your offering to go? Up. That's right, so that God would receive it and be in relationship to us. Well, we, we use incense, I use incense at the offertory when I offer the bread one. And if you'll notice, what is the shape of our altar? You know what the shape is? It's not a circle, it's a rectangle. Yeah, it's a rectangle, very good. And it's almost identical to the size of a casket. A sarcophagus. Now, did Jesus, on his Last Supper, have the Last Supper on a sarcophagus? No. They reclined at table. It was a table on the floor. It wasn't upright. So why do we in the Catholic Church celebrate Mass on something that looks like a grave, in the shape of a grave, since it wasn't that shape in the Last Supper? Because the Church had the, began to have the tradition, especially in Rome, of offering the Mass on the tombs of their dead, for their dead on the tombs of the saints. St. Peter's church is built over the grave of St. Peter, where they had mass. Eventually, they built the church around it. St. Paul's is where he's buried. They had mass on his grave. The connection of this sacrifice of Jesus saving us and our loved ones, that's what we believe. And so um, the, the pagan Romans would have uh, a meal on the great sarcophagus of their loved ones, and they would have a picnic kind of thing. They would even leave food there in case 
their loved ones needed some or something. I don't know, it was a little weird. But they did, they, they always left some on, on the tomb. When the Christians began to practice that, of course, the meal they celebrated there was the Lord's Supper, was the Mass. And that is why in our old altars, there's a little uh, relic of some saint. We may not have the whole body, but we got part of them. Because of this whole connection between the celebration of Mass for the dead, for the living. So you'll notice that I incense the altar the exact way that I incense the casket. Because I am blessing the gifts on the altar and the gift of this person's life so that that person is connected. The offering of his life to God or her life to God is joined to the perfect sacrifice of Jesus because there's no better way to get to heaven than through him, with him, and in him. Because he has the perfect sacrifice that was on a cross that conquered death. It is sacred. It is powerful. It is comforting. Now you want to go some other way? In our tradition, it isn't, it isn't as connected. It isn't as, it does not witness what we believe happens in the, in the eternal sacrifice of Jesus celebrated on the altar. And that is why a funeral liturgy is most appropriate. Now, if you can't have a funeral mass, well, some people have um, services at a funeral home. Can you have a Catholic service at a funeral home? Of course you can. Are prayers listened to by God? Of course they are. Does it have sacrificial, sacramental effect? Yes, it does. Is it the best way? Is it the best witness? Does it represent our tradition most fully? It doesn't. There is nothing that, that, that is the fullness of our Catholic prayer and, and as the sacrifice of Jesus that we celebrate at the altar. That's why I always encourage people to have a funeral mass. Now, what if you are, you, you, you're on your cruise ship, you get knocked overboard by the, uh, the uh, bar cart, and you're lost at sea, you don't have a life raft, and your body can't be found. Well, how, what do you do then? Well, you have a memorial mass for the person. You bring their mass intention to, to church. We offer them spiritually. Uh, if there's a cremation, uh, you can bring the cremains. We do everything with cremains as we do with a casket, except we don't clothe it. We don't put a baptismal garment on it, which is called the pall. We sprinkle it with holy water, just as they were baptized because that's when we were united to Christ in the family of God, right? Became members of his body. We remember that. We have the Easter candle that we receive the light from, light from light. All of it is there except for the pole. The pole is a baptismal garment, and since the body has already returned to ashes, you don't clothe ashes. And so we don't put the pole on. When we do have a, a casket there, I really encourage family members to, to place the pall on the casket because who clothed you in white, wrapped you in Jesus when you were baptized? Who did that? Your mother or your, and your godmother. And hopefully your grandfathers did something too. <laughs> Usually it takes about five of them to get the you know, <laughs> sleeves in and the thing buttoned. And it takes about you know, a village. But it's their clothes. What it is is you're clothed with Christ. You have put on Christ. In him you have been baptized. Alleluia. Alleluia. You've been wrapped in Christ. 
Everything at a baptism you have at a funeral. Mass. Except the holy oils. Hopefully they were anointed already. But every all the other symbols. Because what we believe when you enter into the church, into the family of God, is also true when you enter into eternal life. You're not naked. You're clothed with Christ and his dignity. Who clothed you at your baptism? Your family. Who should clothe you at your funeral? Your family. Now, it's a lot more efficient if you have the funeral home director does it because they know exactly how it goes. And bam, bam, bam. You can just get it done all efficient. But where were they when you were baptized? They were having somebody else's funeral. Yeah. But they weren't there when you were baptized. So anyway, as you can tell, I have some passion, some belief in what is most meaningful. And I think that if families are engaged in the unfolding of that, it can, first of all, it's like acknowledging this is, this is remembering their baptism. Remember the sprinkling rite? It's holy water is always baptism. And being clothed with Christ. Why wouldn't the family do that? Unless they don't know or, or something. You know what I mean? It's usually very meaningful. That's the first time I've heard of that. Yeah. And that's the problem is that people don't know it. And so they don't think about it. So they don't, it doesn't occur to them in their planning. And that's why I think I need to teach this. It's part of the richness. Now, do you have to do that? Do you have to have a baptismal garment? A pall on a thing? have to. By the way, if you notice that for veterans with the, with, the, with the flag, it comes off. When it comes to the church, it comes off. Nothing surpasses Christ in our church. Nothing can save you but Christ in our church. Therefore, I love the flag, but in church, you better be dressed in Jesus. Who is going to protect you now, you know, besides him? Who can share his, that dignity and glory with you? Then Jesus. So that is the liturgy. Um, and at the interment, of course, it's the third piece of it. Uh, normally the ground is blessed, like at St. Joe, that was consecrated ground. So, you know, it's not going to be used for a garden. It's not going to be used for a gump. It's not going to be a factory. Nobody's going to build a house on it. It's, it's consecrated to honor the deceased. And by the way, so St. Paul says, do you not know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? That God dwells in, in you. Those who kill the Christian violates the presence of God. It's like destroying the temple where God dwells. Isn't that amazing to believe that? That God would take up residence in this lowly body of ours, imperfect as it is. This is remarkable. You know how when the Pope went to uh, Israel, he bent down and kissed the ground, holy ground. God walked on this earth. Well, guess what? God's walking around in this body. In you, I recognize the Christ in you. I reverence the Christ in you. You are a Christ bearer, Christopher. You bear Christ. Therefore, this, is, this temple is to be honored Yes, it's going to turn to dust, and it ain't going to be pretty, unless you think dust is pretty. But it is the temple, and therefore it is not to be disregarded as unimportant. It should be kissed because God is present here, and God walked the earth here. It's a very powerful thing to, to, to understand, to see and believe. That is why we enter, and that's why cremains, for example, 
It is, it's not, it's not prefer, it's not our tradition. It's our tradition to protect those ashes by placing them in a place where they will be undisturbed in a consecrated ground, which means it's reserved to honor the, this person's body that was the temple, All right? To put it in golf balls or to, uh, you know, I've had people, they, these urns, beautiful things, urn, end up in a, in a yard sale. And they go, there's somebody's ashes in here. This is not just an urn. This, is, this has got somebody in here. Well, somebody forgot to bury it their loved one you know they were going to get around to it and and then they died and whoever followed behind them didn't know didn't care wasn't paying whatever it was it's not very careful some people want to scatter to the wind and and the church does not endorse that it doesn't forbid it doesn't say you're going to hell in a handbasket if you do it uh, it does not say that but the the church does not endorse that because what, what does that mean when you scatter it to the wind or on the ocean or wherever? What does it say? That that body doesn't need to be remembered as a temple of the Holy Spirit, doesn't need to be honored. Uh, and that in, in some ways it could be pantheism. The whole world is God, but not the Father, Son, and Spirit. And so scattering says, you know what I mean, from a, if you want to get theologically specific. Now, I know people do it, and sometimes they do it with the best of intentions and with no malice. But the issue becomes, I think, are we faithful to our tradition? What does our tradition encourage us to do? How do we celebrate a person's life and honor the fact that the Holy Spirit dwelt in them. How do we do that? Well, this is how we do it in Catholic, as Catholics. Uh, this is this is, and it is, uh, it is a healing for people. Say we have beautiful liturgies. Kind of odd to say a funeral is beautiful, but why shouldn't it be? I mean. You know, all the saints that we honor on Saints Day is their death date, not their birth date. It's the day they were born into eternal life. If we know when they died, it's that day that we celebrate, not when they got on this earth. It's when they enter the kingdom in its fullness. That's what we're happy about. Good? Now, if you want to, ooh, I took 30 minutes. So, yeah, well, I, I've got to be respectful for those who, who uh, uh, don't have more time. This, this uh, is, is designed to say uh, what your, if you want to let family know what your wishes are. Now, by the way, you, you can, yeah, you can, God bless you.